His story is unbelievable. A lucrative young drug dealer who became an addict and gets busted. Then he works undercover, not once, but with three different outlaw biker gangs. Chris Blatchford in this Fox 11 Investigates reports on the infiltrator. It's deceivingly quiet as heavily armed ATF agents sneak up on a house in rural Maine ready to arrest a wanted hitman. He's ready too. More than two dozen rounds are fired. An agent takes a bullet in his protective vest. And inside, Thomas Maine, an enforcer for the Outlaws Motorcycle Club, known as Tomcat, is dead. Charles Falco knew Tomcat. And he had told me and, and one of the undercover ATF agents that he was going to die in a shootout. Falco worked undercover for nearly five years as a biker gang infiltrator. And this is his story. Yeah, wasn't, wasn't a good guy. In the 1990s, he was making $50,000 a month working as a drug dealer for Bulgarian mobsters. He eventually became addicted to meth. Hit rock bottom, um, was suicidal, didn't want to live anymore. Then he got busted. And looking at 20 years in prison, he agreed to work the streets as a DEA informant for two years. He started enjoying it. I wanted to step up and do something even bigger. So after connecting with a San Bernardino Sheriff's biker unit deputy, Falco, for months, started hanging out in bars to hook up with members of the Vagos Motorcycle Club, also known as the Green Machine. Well, they're organized crime, just like, you know, what we call them, mafia on wheels. Within a year, he went from hang around to a slave-like prospect to full patch member secretly working for the ATF. The club's motto is, we give what we get. And Falco knew what he'd get if exposed as an infiltrator. Beat until you were half dead and then they put a bullet in your head and you know, bury you out in the desert. Falco picked up the nickname Quick Draw because he was fast with his fists. There were fights every week. They're kind of a violent fraternity that is doing violent acts for no reason. At a 2005 biker run here in Kona, Hawaii, Falco is here, standing next to Ryan Rhino Matheson, who was involved in the 2004 murder of James Gavin, known as Little Jimmy. Two masked men, including Rhino, invaded this Apple Valley house looking for drugs and money. Little Jimmy was shot and killed when he ran. The trigger man was accomplice Daniel Foreman, a Vago enforcer known as Twist, who has 22, a Vago symbol tattooed on his neck. He is a big time meth head, very paranoid. Usually when he comes to the door, he's pointing a gun at you like this. But Falco walks to Twist's front door, carrying a hidden tape recorder and gets a confession. Yeah, well, that wasn't my first rodeo, you know what I mean? Yeah. I machine, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just one. Yeah, I just have a good shot at it. Falco. Seen here in the midst of Vagos at a hangout in Hesperia, recorded two and a half years of crimes. He actually became an officer in the Victorville Vagos chapter. And at the end of what the feds called Operation 22 Green, 25 Vagos and associates went to prison for firearm, drug, assault, and murder charges. Falco, for a year, then disappeared into the witness protection program in Virginia working as a mechanic. I started to miss doing something that I thought was important. So again, with the ATF's blessing, in 2008 he joined as a prospect two agents who were already infiltrating another biker gang, the Mongols. But the Mongols had less than a dozen members on the East Coast. So what, we're, we're Mongols, um, no one cares. But the outlaws, the world's second largest biker gang and always interested in expanding, was courting their Mongol chapter. So in December of 2008, we said, why don't we become outlaws? To earn their outlaw colors, for six months they had to prospect all over again. Falco says it was brutal. They punish you by beating you up. But in 2009, Falco, as chapter vice president, and three undercover ATF agents finally were able to set up their own outlaw clubhouse outside Richmond, Virginia, and it was scary and dangerous. Not only were we, again, worrying about, you know, being found out by the outlaws, but we were being hunted the whole time by Hell's Angels. 
in February of 2010, outlaw Joseph Hojo Ferriolo was assassinated outside his Hamden, Connecticut tattoo parlor, presumably shot dead by Hell's Angels. I'm having to check for car bombs. In October of 2009, outside this entrance to a Hell's Angels clubhouse in upstate Maine, an outlaw hit team ambushed Angel Gary Watson. The bullets left him partially paralyzed. The outlaws are a war machine. Falco says orders came from outlaw international president Milwaukee Jack Roska, pictured here with the undercover agents, to shoot Hell's Angels on sight. But Falco says driving bikes in tight packs going up to 100 miles per hour was the most dangerous part of his infiltrations. Falco hit a guardrail at 50 miles per hour and broke his neck, sliced up his knee, and badly damaged his shoulder. He had to wear his arm in a sling for a year. Finally, after two years undercover with the outlaws, this is the, the same day Tomcat Maines died in a shootout with ATF agents, cops blew the doors off clubhouses in seven states in Operation Black Diamond. 27 outlaws were arrested and later sent to jail, along with top boss Milwaukee Jack, who got 20 years for racketeering. Charles Falco has written a book about his experiences, is now living a normal life, and is always clearly aware of the outlaw's motto, God forgives, outlaws don't. If these guys do get me and kill me, I can say that I served our society and did something good in my life. It was repentance for me. He says he feels that his actions saved lives and that over and over again, he says it was God who saved his. And he explains, people who don't understand that have never lived on the edge. Chris Blatchford, Fox 11 News.